Well, now you've worked on a lot of records. Some of you probably a two or three day record, but you also work for months on a record. Yeah. What, what, what happens if you have a record that you're going to spend months on? The first week, what are you going to do? Um, you, don't, you don't start out knowing you're going to spend months because nobody, nobody that I know, even the people who secretly do know they're going to spend months on their record, you always walk in going, we're going to have this in two weeks. I got a mixer booked. We're going to knock this thing out. So the first week you act like, yeah, this is going to go really quick, right? And we're just going to get this thing finished. It's usually more like you have a, the longest records. You start out thinking, we're going to track for a month. Uh, we're going to overdub for a few weeks, and we're going to mix for a few weeks. And of course, that never is the case, um, unless you've got a budget that you, you are married to, and then it better be the case. You set up microphones, and you get a sound going, and you start tracking. Um, some sessions, God, they all go so different. My job's always the same. I always show up and think, I've got to have a great vocal sound going. Somebody is going to sing, even if we're just tracking. I'm going to set up as if we're doing great vocals. If there's a drummer, we have to have great drum sounds, a series of guitars and guitar mics available. In other words, I don't do rap records, so I'm not that well versed on what goes on in there, but I have hung out with the people who work with Busta Rhymes and um, that other big one out there, Dr. Dre. Um, his bass player, I expected him to come in and be like a scary guy that was going to scare me and that I wouldn't know how to record because Maybe they had some special bass thing, but he ended up being a classically trained uh, bassist that had a degree in, in music and was one of the most gentle, soft-spoken, versatile, musical, lovely beings I've ever met. Mike Elizondo is his name. Again, so I thought some big, scary rap bass player was going to show up, and I wouldn't know how to record rap bass, that it would be so different than what I do. And it wasn't. He had a P bass and a B-15. It's like, well, I was like, where's your special rap rig? You know, and, and, and I was like, so when you're in with Buster Rhymes and Dr. Dre and all those people, is it like, what do you use? He's like, well, we go right to analog, just like you're doing, and Dre likes a U-47, just like you like, and everything's exactly like you do, and I got my MPC 60s. So even in the rap world, even in the, in the things that you fantasize being so different, they're exactly the same thing. Vocal mics, drum mics, bass, everything's got to go through a microphone or a DI box. But there might be other stuff I don't know about, so, but not in my world. Any questions out there? What about, oh, go ahead. Uh, do you like working with bigger, more established artists or your Um. It, it, uh, the bigger, more established artists are often far more experienced in the studio and as a result makes it much easier to record them because they know that in a world that is absolutely limitless, which is music, recording is limited and they understand that concept and um, so that experience sometimes makes it like, like Neil Young, I was terrified to record him, but he's so used to being in the studio that he made it so easy to record him. Whereas young artists don't understand that, again, while music is limitless, recording is not limitless. Recording is very limited. Um, and you often spend a lot of time making them understand why the drums can't sound like Led Zeppelin. Because you're not Led Zeppelin, and it is not 1969. And we're not in London. Um, so, but the pressure of the established big artist is, is enormous. The money being spent is enormous and the pressure on me to deliver is huge, whereas a young artist, there's not so much pressure. I can I feel a little more free in there. And my favorite thing to do, which doesn't support my living, is the people who are my friends that I'm doing it for free because we, we're loving it. And then there's no pressure, then it's all just fun. Um, so both, you know, I like the experience of the established artist, but um, I like the, the lack of, um, of that piercing pressure. Um, when you have a young artist that you know is just kind of happy to be there. Um, you were just talking about how you know experienced artists have more experience in the studio and know what they're doing. Uh, what advice do you have for young artists in this room that are going into the studio working with an engineer? Like, what can we do to make it easier for you? Um, firstly, um, you. It's hard to say because if it's me, I want to say that you trust me. I'm not here to lie to you. I'm not here to 
um, give you an actually a, a, a poor quality recording and say it's a good one because I'd really rather get on, you know, to whatever else it is I have to do in my life. I'm not going to cheat you out of what is what I consider to be my best work. Because every artist, I always think, this is my best work ever in that moment. I always think that I'm doing way better than I've ever done, um, and that's what keeps me going. So for me, I want to say, trust me. If I tell you what you're asking for is not realistic and it's probably not going to sound good, believe me, because um, it's going to save you time, and I'm going to make you a sound as good as is possible. But some engineers, that's not the case. Um, do not be afraid to walk up and, and very diplomatically, don't attack your engineer, even if he or she is an idiot and needs to be attacked and hit. Um, don't, because they do have control over at least your recording in that moment and your money is going down the drain. Just walk up and say, my vocal just sounds a little bit dark to me. I know that in the studio here, um, things are different. Do you mind if we hear a few <coughs> things that I'm familiar with so that I can understand where I am. Um, it would help me a lot if I could listen to a few of these of my favorite records for myself because I'm confused because in here it sounds a little dark and I'm a little worried that I'd like to have my vocal brighter. If, if they don't let you do that, you need to get a new engineer right away. If, and, and remember, when you listen to a finished record, it's, it's going to be way brighter because it's been mastered and all these processes have happened, but you still get an idea. And then just say, would you mind adding a little more high end to this element or that element? Um, would you mind um, helping me understand how the kick drum really sounds? Because I'm a little worried. I think it sounds a little poofy, and I'm a little scared about arresting an entire track on the kick drum. I think it needs more punch. I'm not trying to be a know-it-all. But I, do, um, I would like to hear the kick drum in solo, and I would like to. And if, the, if, if you get a whole lot of... Um, not defiance, but if, if, if it just really won't work with you on letting you understand what's going on at the console, you need to consider that the engineer um, is not the right person. The engineer should be very open and say, oh really? The kick drum is it sounding shitty back there? Like, like I, if you come up behind me and say, the bass sounds weird to me, I know I don't know what I'm doing, I'm young, but to me it doesn't sound right, I want to know that while I still can fix it. Not later on when I can't fix it anymore. So. But just don't don't get an attitude like this sounds shitty, man, because that's not going to get anywhere. Just say I'm, I'm, I'm a, I don't know what's going on, and I, I want to sit by you for a while. I want you to show me some things so that I can decide if I like how it sounds or not. And and yeah, diplomacy again. But don't be shy to ask because if you don't say anything, you could have a great engineer like me who really wishes that you would have said, I really wish my guitar tones had more mid range. Is this something we could do with the mic or something you can EQ? Um, I won't know that you are unhappy, and I won't be able to have fixed it, and I'll be sad later when I find out that you hate the way you sound. So. Well, do you find that that relationship between the musician and the producer, if there's a producer, if that relationship is good, uh, whether or not the musician knows the engineer, uh, he tends to trust what the engineer is doing because it's actually going through the you know, producer. Yeah, I mean. You, I, I often don't work with outside producers. When I started out in my career, I, I worked as an assistant to big producers and engineers, like everybody will. But when I, when I became an independent engineer, I found this really great um, little area for myself that was artists who were trying to produce themselves that needed an engineer. So literally, the first seven or eight records that I did on my own were with artists who were producing themselves, and neither one of us really knew how to produce records, so to speak, so we were, we were making it up as we went along. So there was no other third party for me to go, um, the guitar player just asked me to, to, to brighten up his guitars. Are you cool with that? There, there was no triangle happening. It was just me and an artist going, I don't know. Do you like it? I don't know. I like it. And so, um, by the time I, I got very established and there was another pro a producer in the room, I was hired because the sounds that I was already known to get and the producer would rarely contradict that. If the artist said, uh, my guitar tone, da, 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 the producer would say, go talk to Trina. I'd tell her to fix it then. Like in other words, there was already a trust established that I was the one who was going to get the sounds and that unless the producer said, hey, can you know, get this kick going like a so-and-so's kick, and then I'd be like, oh, I know what kick you mean. You know what, put up the big 28, and 
um, there was trust established that I was hired to get the sounds and that very nobody really wanted to get involved in that. Mostly the producer was like, she does the sounds, let's you and me talk about the fact that this <coughs> is a boring song <laughs> and we you know, need to speed it up or something. So yeah, I, I didn't start out where I ever had a producer who wasn't sure if I knew what I was doing and therefore the artist the artist always came to me for the sound, and then if there's a producer, they go to the... Usually now, if there's a producer, it's because they're writing with the artist, and the artist and the producer are a writing team, and I'm once again completely responsible for the recording. But over the years, that, that uh, producer-writing relationship, I think, probably has evolved more than it existed before, because a lot of producers actually came in you know, right. to take charge of the studio to make sure the record was actually made. Yeah. Whether or not the, uh, in, in, in my case, I, I, I can recall that the record company would suggest a producer, you know, and whether or not uh, the, the artist, the band, whoever liked that producer, if the relationship between the artist and producer was not happening, then the relationship with the artist engineer may or may not. Yeah, actually, I get your point. Um, luckily for me, that in the instances where that has been the case, Blues Traveler was an instance where the band was having trouble with their chosen producer. And so I would have the guitar player coming up to me at night saying, I want to redo all my guitars for today. Uh, and I would, I can't say no to the artist. This is, and this isn't a young artist, this is the Chandler from the Blues Traveler. So I would put down all kinds of new guitars, certainly not go over anything. And the next morning, Matt would come in that's the producer, and I'd say, Chan kept me here all night doing more guitars. Um, we got four tracks. He'd play them, I'd play them for Matt, and he'd say, I hate them, they suck. Get rid of them. And then Chan would show up, and I'd say, Matt hated your guitar parts, they suck. He wants me to get rid of them. I muted them. Um, all I would do is be a go between. In other words, the artist didn't blame me. Um, I, I never snuck around and thought, hey, I'll get in good with the artist here. I see a chance to take over. I would just say, um, Matt, um, John wants to do vocals with me, not you, because he hates you and he says that you're a little fuck. Okay, you know, and just literally <laughs> not make myself the person who was seen to be sneaky or siding with either party. And then John would say, why did you tell Matt I said that? Because you did say that. Um, but then they could see that they could trust me. I wasn't going to lie and I wasn't going to sneak around and I, I kept myself <laughs> safe. Um, usually though now, to tell you the truth, if the band has brought in a producer or the label and I've been hired as an engineer, that is my job. I don't want to do the production. I'm not getting points, I'm not getting paid for it. Why make more work for myself? I just sit there and wait. And if they're fighting behind me, I wait until someone says, can we roll? I don't turn around and go, here's my chance to get the producer gig. I really don't care. If I am the producer, I take my responsibility and I produce that record. If I am not, frankly, I'm glad because then um, I just can focus on the recording. Um, and if there's a producer there who is not doing his or her job and is making it my job, I will be the first to sit with the producer and say, you either start doing your job or you start giving me some of your points because I am not going to produce this record for you while you are not here and you are going to go walk away with three points and I walk away with my day rate. So either give me points and I will produce it for you and you can have the credit. I don't care. I want the money. Um, I'm very blatantly honest with everybody in the studio and as a result um, I have a smooth time. I've had a few records that I've left recently but mostly that's because I can't bend over and I think I either have to love you right now or I can't um, do this because I can't bend over. Thank you. Question. Scissors. Andrew, let them. Um, have you ever worked with an artist named Ryan Skelly? Yeah. <laughs> that's my cousin. I, just, I, I did. I, sure I, um, I co-produced with Ryan and mixed his um, record that's currently released and did a bunch more tracks with him recently. And Scully is delightful and uh, he's a very talented man. Um, he's very much part of that. Um, I become a little bit of a mom on those sessions where it is, you will show up here at 11 a.m., there will be no drugs. <laughs> we will 
all, and I, I know right down to you will not get drunk um, when I am here. I don't care if you're paying me or not. Um, yeah, so I worked with Ryan. He's um, he's wonderful. He's he's a, he's a great artist to work with. Um, but you know, I, I don't. I'm getting. The, I don't like a lot of partying in the studio. And a lot of people see the studio as a place to party, and I don't. I see it as a place to do work and then go home. I, I'm boring. I like to go home and watch the History Channel, and and I don't go out and hang out, and I don't get drunk. Regardless, I never really have been. So. Um, they thought of me as a little bit of a mommy, and uh, but he's delightful, and he'll have a new record pretty soon. <laughs>